<clears throat> well, we're still in Hebrews, and uh, we didn't finish Hebrews 10 last week, and so I just wanted to go back there to a few verses. Uh, Hebrews 10 ends up with a plea for consistency. Uh, hang in there, basically. He says, don't give up your faith. Don't lose your confidence. Don't backslide. Anybody ever backslide? Okay, let's ask another way. Anybody who never backslid? Uh, I think we've all been backsliders, haven't we? We've all um, let go of something we once possessed and had to get it back again in our relationship with the Lord. Isn't God good, though? He does not say you can't come back. The main danger is if we get too far away, we may not want to come back. We may lose the uh, longing for what we, we're missing. So don't let it go too long. That's really the warning in this last part of Hebrews 10, is don't let yourself get too far away. Don't let yourself fall clear away from God's grace. So there would be nothing more that he could pour out to bring you back. That's the great appeal. And I know that you folks have been listening to the Lord for a long time. But even among the saints, sometimes I find people who aren't sure of their standing with the Lord and are not sure that they're close to the Lord. Let me assure you that if you're hearing any little voice telling you, I want to be closer to you, it's not too late for you. If there's any longing, any, any appeal in your heart, any pulling from the Lord, then listen to that. Uh, sometimes people say, I'm afraid I've committed the unpardonable sin. Well, anybody who's afraid of it hasn't done it. <laughs> because the unpardonable sin is one for which you don't seek any pardon. Because you don't uh, acknowledge any guilt and you don't feel any longing to be with God at that point. So he says, do not throw away this confident trust in the Lord. Remember the great reward it brings you. You know, I suppose it's a part of aging, but you get to the point where you realize the only thing you really, really can't get along without is the Lord in your life. Isn't that the truth? That becomes the one thing you just cannot part with. I want the young people to know that too, though. Young people, no matter what the world offers you, Jesus is the only real comfort. That song said as much, didn't it? And this is all we really need. Patient endurance is what you need. Now, hang in there. You're a Christian already. Now you need patient endurance, all right? Who is it that wants you to give up? Never forget that every day He is after us. I've thought many times it's a good thing the Lord doesn't sleep because the devil doesn't sleep either. And He is, he is after us. So every day we must be filled up with the hope and courage we find in Jesus only. That's why we don't even dare start the day without Jesus. Are any of you so bold that you just get right up and go to the shower and grab something to eat and run off to work? If you do that, you might as well be saying, be saying, Hey, devil, come on. Come on after me today. I'm ready for you now, and I'm going to just do whatever you say. Because you have not entered into the shelter of the embrace of Jesus Christ. Your faith will be weak, your courage will be low, your longing for things that satisfy will be high, and the devil will find something to drag you down. Some of you who have experience know I'm telling the truth, aren't I? Start the day with Jesus or the devil considers it an open door. So you need patient endurance so that you will continue to do God's will, and then you will receive all that He has promised. Notice that what we need is the patient endurance. The continuing to do God's will is the result, the consequence. It is the outgrowth of having this uh, strength that we find in Christ. We don't do God's will and then get the strength. We receive from Christ this patient endurance, and then we can do God's will. Do you see? Never, ever, ever 
commit yourself to doing God's will without first seeking his strength. Because then you'll fail to do his will and you'll be even more discouraged. Let me put it another way. Don't make promises to God until you have claimed his promises to you. That is always the right order. For in just a little while, the coming one will come and not delay. Now realize that this was written a couple thousand years ago. Does that make us fear that maybe there's a couple more thousand? How many of you think we have any reason to expect a couple more thousand? I didn't think so. See, you're Seventh Day Adventists, most of you. Yeah, and you know that that Adventist part means Jesus is coming soon. Well, we thought he was coming sooner than this, but he is coming soon. He's not waiting another 2,000 years. That fourth kingdom has already come. The little horn has already grown out of that fourth kingdom. The ten horns have already grown out of that fourth kingdom. And the ten horns already have their crowns on them and have had for a long time. And that seventh head has received its deadly wound. And that deadly wound is already healed. And all the world is already beginning to wonder after the beast. And the United States is becoming the lackey of the European religious Western Christian coalition and the end is coming because the end of revelation is coming. So, he's coming soon. We still anticipate the strong possibility of living to see him come in the clouds. That's a good hope. Someone said to me a while back, oh, pastor, now do you really think that at 95, I should have any hope of seeing Jesus come in the clouds. And I said, absolutely, not only that, you should have hope of being part of the loud cry. Why, do you know what the Holy Spirit can do to an old body? I'm waiting to see those 95-year-old ladies out there going door to door. Think of the witness that's going to be. I'm waiting to see under the power of the latter rain, people throwing their canes and crutches and walkers away. You don't think that's going to happen? I'm waiting to see that, that, uh, that dementia fade back. Anybody look forward to that? <laughs> I'm waiting to see people who can hardly remember their birthday. I'm trying to forget mine, actually. I'm waiting to see those people who discover suddenly that they can preach. You think any miracles like that will take place? I do too. So don't you say, oh, no, I'm too old to have any part in the last work. That's not so. You ask the Lord to use you, he will use you. He will not delay. I like that. He will not delay. You know what that implies to me? That implies that there's a time when he's already set that he's coming. And anyway, why would Jesus say nobody knows the time except the Father? Which doesn't that imply that there is a time? That's what it implies to me. And even though he seems to delay, he really doesn't delay, the Bible says elsewhere. And my righteous ones will live by faith. Faith is a big word. And it has lots of ramifications. And I am not going to try to preach a thorough theological exposition of the word faith today. Let me simply say that in order to live this on a day-to-day -day basis, it has come to me just to boil down to this, trusting God to keep his promises. That's, that's, that's what's come, come to be in my experience. <coughs> the righteous ones will live by faith, but I will take no pleasure in anyone who turns away. See, when we turn away, we have given up on the Lord. That's the point, isn't it? We have, we have stopped believing his promises. Why do I have to go back to the world? Because I don't believe God's promise to make me happy. Why do I have to uh, stop going to church when someone's mean to me? Because I don't believe God's promise to bring healing between brothers and sisters. Why do I have to stop trying to be a Christian because I don't believe God's promise that I am his creation and I, I am a Christian only if he makes me one 
and that I'm just relying on him to do that. We've stopped believing his promises when we fall away. We've given up on God. A lot of people give up. They say, well, God's given up on me, or I think God's given up on me. God doesn't give up on you. It's when we give up on him that we have a problem. So my righteous ones will live by faith. But the ones who turn back, who turn away, I want you to understand why God has no pleasure in the ones who turn away. See, we always have everything. We always think in terms of behavior. But God is always thinking in terms of relationship. God eventually finds no pleasure in those who find no pleasure in him. Are you listening? What is it that God wants from us? Us. He wants us. He wants you. He wants me. He wants our affection. He wants our love. He wants us to be interested in him. He is the lover of our soul. He finds us alluring. He finds us beautiful. He finds us desirable. He longs for us. And then he comes to us and he shares with us as much of his heart as we will allow him to give us. And we taste it and we see that it's good and we settle back comfortably into the confidence of knowing that the, our maker loves us and longs for us and desires us. And if we turn away from that, we are rejecting not his commandments, not the doctrines of the church. Yes, those all are secondary issues. We're rejecting himself. Do you understand? We're rejecting his love. We're rejecting his embrace. We're rejecting his intimacy. And that ultimately brings God to the point where he cannot see any pleasure in us any longer. He wants to give us himself. We're not just rejecting the truth or a lifestyle, it would be his own embrace that we would say no to. But I thank God you're not saying no. We're not like those, the apostle says. We're not like that. We're not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. Well, a few of you said amen. See, this is the assurance we have in love with Jesus. In love with you. Now, every time the devil says, you know what? You're still not very far along in your spiritual growth. I just want you to know that at your present trajectory, you know, the standard being here and your expected lifespan being here somewhere and your present, I don't think you're going to make it. The devil ever say anything like that to you? <laughs> you know what my stock answer is to him? I am not going to make it, but Jesus loves me, and he's already made it in my behalf, and he's already worked out how he's going to yank me along anyway. Amen? Amen. I will not be told that I'm not going to make it. In fact, the Lord is going to make sure that I make it no matter what he has to do to me, because I've given him permission. <laughs> Sometimes he has to do something a little bit unpleasant, you know. Have you ever found that? Just to get you over a little hump in your thinking? You know, yeah. Yeah, sometimes he has to do something a little unpleasant. But that's okay. I know that he is definitely going to take me. And the reason I know that is because I seek his love again every day. Do you do that? He knows I want his love. I want it. He's not going to turn away from somebody who wants his love. That's the whole purpose of my being. He made me so he could love me. And if I want to be loved by him, then he's not going to turn me away. Amen. I do. I, I really do. That's, that's what I live for. So we are not like those who turn away from God to their own destruction. We are the faithful ones. It's not bragging. It's not bragging. Because we're faithfully seeking his love in our lives. We're the faithful ones whose souls will be saved. And notice how that's put. Who
whose souls will be saved. This is the biblical way to express it. Some Christians have gone ahead of that and said, I am saved, by which they mean, you know, there's no possibility of my ever deciding against it. I'm not going to decide against it, are you? No, I'm not going to. But nevertheless, they go that little extra step too far, you know, that it's like all finished. It's finished in Christ, but the, the Bible puts it this way. Our souls will be saved because we're hanging on to Jesus. Amen? We're hanging on to Jesus. The devil's not going to tear us loose from Jesus. In fact, the harder he tries to tear us loose from Jesus, the more he drives us to Jesus. <laughs> so now we go into the 11th chapter, which begins so famously, faith is the confidence that what we hope for will actually happen. So we do have confidence that in the not distant future now, we will be with the Lord. Yeah. And if you make your daily devotional life about loving Jesus and letting Jesus love you, then being with the Lord becomes the attractive thing. You know? And that becomes the really, really attractive thing. And I used to think, we'll have to take a number like you do at the post office, you know? Did you ever have to take one of those numbers? Yeah. Oh, I know where. It's at the, it's at the Department of Motor Vehicles, isn't it? That's the really awesome one. I, I went in there uh, a couple months ago, and I saw up on, the, up on the screen, it was number 51, you know? And then I had to take a number, and my number was, one, no, I think it was 210. Can that possibly be? And then I looked around the crowd and I said, Yeah, I think there are a hundred and some people ahead of me here. Oh, no. So, you know what they say take a seat. Do they have any idea how bad those chairs are in there? I don't know what's wrong with my rear end, but I can't stand those chairs. I just can't hardly, I get so miserable. So I said, no way am I going to take a seat. I can count. I'll take my number, and I'll go down to, to uh, uh, Taco Bell or somewhere. So I'm going to take a seat. Anyway, it takes forever, you know, to, to sometimes... Uh, to get any attention from anybody important in this world. Um, but uh, Jesus, I've really re learned just the last few years that Jesus has the awesome ability to give all of us his personal attention simultaneously. <laughs> so we're going to get to go and be with the Lord, and we really are going to get to be with him. Not just in groups. I mean, really, we're going to get to be with him. And we're going to enjoy his presence. In fact, we already do, don't we? We already do. But we're going to enjoy his presence in a more, even more real way. And his voice will be speaking to us uh, in a, as just like right in our ear. It's just like, just like visiting together. And, and it's, it's, it's going to be great all the time. And it's already starting. Uh, you know, the only way to make sure you get to heaven is to start now. Being in heaven every day. That's right. So... Uh, through their faith, the people in the days of old earned a good reputation. Now, that word reputation is not the way we use it today. Today, we use reputation to mean that uh, this is the way you are uh, viewed. You know, it's kind of your public character. But uh, this means that they got a good report. They, good things have been said about them because of their faith. And he speak, and you know this chapter goes into the lives of many of the, of the people from the Old Testament. It's so awesome. For instance, he says here, uh, it was by faith that Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. You, do you know why I use this New Living Translation in preaching sometimes? Because there are actually people in the congregation who don't know what an ark is. And let me tell you something. You think that's kind of offensive? 
I want this church to be filled up with people who don't know what an ark is. Are you with me there? So I am in, in anticipation of that event. I'm using a simple version. I thank you that you haven't criticized me for it yet. Just want to do a little preventive in case you were thinking about it. All right. So by faith, Noah built a large boat to save his family from the flood. Now, that really did take some faith because he'd never seen a flood. Nobody in the world had ever seen a flood. <laughs> so you see, faith in his case was believing what God said would happen. Now, how are we saved? By believing what God says will happen, or has happened, as in the case of the cross and our forgiveness for sin. Believing that what God says is true, even though we can't see it. Believing that God says, Dan Lehman, you are my eternal companion. You are a holy saint, worthy of walking with the angels forever. Now, I can't see that yet. Can you see that? No, I, I can't see it. But I'm walking by faith, amen? Yeah, I believe a flood is coming. How many of you believe that? Two floods, actually. A flood of the Holy Spirit is coming, amen? Followed by a flood of iniquity. Followed by a flood of fire. And I believe it. That's, that's faith, because when I look around the church, I don't see it yet. But I believe it. I look around the community. I don't see it. There's a lot of indifference in the community. But I believe it. Do you believe it? I believe the best day for this church is yet ahead. How many of you believe that? Uh, this church has had a better day in the past. Isn't that true? It's had a better day in the past when it was always crowded. But then it's, it spawned a number of other congregations. And people have grown older. And children have moved off to hither and thither. And people have died and so forth. And so it's had a better day. I believe that no matter how good its former day was, its best day is still ahead. And that's not because I'm a positive thinker. Ask my wife. I am not a positive thinker. You know, you, see, you know I'm not. A, you know, when she makes something in the kitchen, she's a good cook. She's been cooking for years. When she makes something, though, I, I ask her this. Are you sure you got it together right? Is that going to come out good? See, because I'm not naturally a positive thinker. I naturally fear things won't be good. But no, I believe the best day of the church is ahead. Not because I'm a positive thinker, but because God has promised it. I'm going to pour out my spirit on your children, your young men, your old men, et cetera, et cetera. And it's going to be glorious. So I just want to be part of that, don't you? So the flood is coming, he said, and Noah believed. That's why Noah, see, he's such a good example. He had to wait 120 years. Anybody been waiting 120 years? He had to build that boat for 120 years. Believing that there would be a flood. I can just see him. A flood is coming. And the people say, uh, a what? What is a flood, Noah? A flood is when everything gets run over with water. Noah, our scientific calculations show that there isn't enough water on the planet to cover the surface of the planet even if it all came out from its underground currents somehow. Noah said, God told me a flood is coming. For 120 years he said that, even though everybody said he was really stupid. Wow, what faith, huh? Jesus is coming. A lot of people think that's stupid. You know why I believe it? Just because God said so. But I think I see a little evidence too. Yeah. So, so poor Noah, you know, he went on preaching, and his preaching was so ineffective, literally no one believed him. He finally just had to, had to drag his kids and his, and his family into the ark. See, what they didn't realize was that there was this 
outer atmosphere. Remember that one that's mentioned in Genesis, the first chapter? Yeah, they, they, the scientists hadn't figured that out yet. They didn't realize that there was enough water to cover the planet out there and that it would come down when God said so. It came down. Let me tell you, you think you've seen a flood. Have you, anybody ever seen a real downpour? Well, they say it's like raining cats and dogs. I've always been thankful it doesn't really rain cats and dogs. But anyway, you've seen that where, the, where you can't even move your window wipers fast enough because it's just... But the flood, when it came, was really beyond beyond. It's a wonder that you could even breathe because it was like you were already buried just by the depth of the rain that was coming so fast. Amazing. And that boat went up and all the people who thought Moses or Noah was so stupid regretted that. So faith is believing what God says. He obeyed God who warned him about things that had never happened before. Well, this is where, you know, we're not even, we don't even have the challenge that he had. What we're saying is that the old church-state alliance that did happen before is coming back. And people say that's stupid. But we've already seen it once. If it can happen once, can it happen twice? If God says it would happen, it could happen even if it never happened before. But it's happened already once and it's going to happen again. So we, we, we believe what God says. It was by faith that Abraham obeyed when God called him to leave home. Boy, it's hard to leave home. I mean, unless you're, unless you're 18. It's hard, it gets harder and harder to leave home, doesn't it? It's easier in your 20s, in your 30s. I just left home, uprooted, came up here. It was the hardest time yet. But I was coming where I knew and to what I knew and to the circumstances I could anticipate. And poor Abraham, when he was told by the Lord to leave home, he didn't, have, he didn't know where he was going. You know, this is a good metaphor, though, for the Christian experience, isn't it? God says, follow me, and he doesn't even tell you where he's going to take you. And he doesn't tell you what it's going to be like or what experiences you have ahead of you. He doesn't tell you what, it's, what the pathway is going to be to heaven for you. He just says, trust me. And you either do or you don't. And everybody who trusts him makes it. Hallelujah. Just trust me. I've got you on a strange path, but I guarantee you I'll get you through. Trust me. So just pick up, pick up your bags. Let's go. Let's go. He did the same thing to his disciples. He does the same thing to us today. He says, I'm taking you to another land, which will be your inheritance. He'd never seen that land, and I've never seen that land either. But I believe that I have a home in heaven. How about you? I'm even asking God if I can have a little architectural influence on it. Yeah. I have at least seven floors in my mansion. And it's supposed to have a waterfall that starts at the top and kind of meanders its way down through each floor. Anyway, I'll tell you about it someday. It was by faith that he went without even knowing where he was going. Well, that's, that's it. That's Christianity. It's by faith. We take off and we don't know where we're going. But God, I know where I'm going to end up. It was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. You know, our God is a consuming fire. So here's how I imagine it. First of all, he says to those waves and all that water, he says, back off. You know, Jesus said, be quiet. He says, back off. And so, boy, those waves, just go, whoop. And then God just blows down the path. And instantly the ground is completely dry. It's been wet and soggy and moist many feet below the surface for eons, but it's instantly completely dry. I can just see those children of Israel going through those walls of water and kicking up dust with their heels. 
And there wasn't ever any dust there before, and there hasn't been any since, but there was dust there for a little while. <laughs> it was by faith that the people of Israel went right through the Red Sea as though they were on dry ground. How many of you have ever met a, a real obstacle that there was no human way to get through? You haven't? Well, then your faith hasn't even been tested yet. Well, it's coming. You just live till Jesus comes. We're going to come to an obstacle. In fact, all of our resources will be taken away from us. And we'll be living on grass. If Nebuchadnezzar could do it, we could do it. And we'll be out there and God will feed us. Don't worry about that. I know food is the biggest thing in your mind, especially right now at 12.05. But uh, God will feed us out there. Uh, but the obstacle will be impossible because they will be after us to annihilate us. And they'll have their infrared uh, satellite things looking down at us and they'll have their helicopters and all that thing and it's impossible that we could survive the Egyptians are at our back and the sea is before us and we're going to be annihilated no we're not because God has promised to have a people ready to meet him when he appears in the sky so um You'll find times, though, before that, I certainly have, I've fallen on my knees and I've said, Lord, except for a miracle, there is no way for me to get through this problem. You ever do that? And did the Lord come through? <laughs> yes, he did. He did. Yeah, you knew he would. You said, Lord, I believe you're going to come through. And he did. It's so wonderful how he does that. So we walk through on dry ground. That's faith. That is faith. Now, all these people died, still believing what God had promised them. They did not receive what was promised, however. They only received a little bit of it. Because the promise that God has actually made to everyone is the promise of living in and with Jesus Christ. And they didn't get that part. They didn't get that part. They got many good things in this world, but they didn't get that. They saw it all from a distance, and they welcomed it, or they longed for it. They believed it. That's why they were faithful all the way to the end, and at the grave they were still saying, I'm dying, but the promise is still coming. That's what I love about the death of the saints. You know, it's, death is such a terrible enemy, but for the saints, it's different. Because they always say, I'm going to see Jesus soon. I'm going to see him in the morning. And they, they believe that even though they haven't yet experienced all the promises, they recognize they're not perfectly holy yet. They recognize they're not absolutely... Uh, you know, in possession of everything that they have in Christ Jesus, they know it's theirs. Amen? And it's so, so wonderful. And so uh, they died, but they, they, they welcomed it already. They already knew it was theirs. They were looking for a better place, a heavenly homeland. That is why God is not ashamed to be called their God I think this is so awesome. I'm ashamed of me. Sometimes. I'm even ashamed of you. But God is not ashamed of us. Uh, so he certainly doesn't base that upon our performance, does he? He's not ashamed of us because of our faith. He's not ashamed of people who trust his promises. Hallelujah. That's who he's not ashamed. He says, yes, I'm their God. Yes, I am happy to call them my children, my people, because they trust my promises. I am not embarrassed to be identified with those people. They believe my promises. Isn't that great? Wow. So he's not ashamed to be called their God, 
for he has prepared a city for them. He has a place for them. He's already got an address for you. Some of you know that I really like things to look nice. And if you don't know it yet, you will know it before we're done together. It's quite high on my priority list for things to look nice. That's one of the things I long for about heaven the most. You know, in heaven, there won't be any central Spokane versus South Hill. You hear what I'm saying? It's going to look nice everywhere. Amen? <laughs> I got an address in heaven, and I want you to know something. It's a good address. <laughs> but so do you. Because in heaven, there's no competitiveness. Are you looking forward to that? Oh, man, I'm looking forward to that. So all these people earned a good reputation because of their faith. Yet none of them, not one of them, received all that God had promised. Not one of them. Because God's great promise is still to be completed. It's complete in Christ. It's complete in Christ. But in our own experience, it's still to be received. So in many ways, we're just their brothers and sisters. Our experience is like theirs. They had faith in his promises. They clung to those. They believed in them. They acted on them day by day. And that's what we do. We have faith in his promises. We believe them. We act on them from day to day. And as we keep doing that, he's not embarrassed to call us his people. And we know that all the promises will be received. So soon now. So soon. For God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection without us. Well, in the book of Hebrews, we've been talking about what that better thing is that he had in mind for us. He had in mind for us that we would live through the Yom Kippur instead of sleeping through it. He had in mind for us that Jesus would cleanse us even while we lived and breathed. And that the promise of a powerful high priest would reach even the living saints and not only the sleeping saints. He had a better promise for those who would come clear down to the end. The promise of losing everything, of giving up everything, of completely, desperately, and helplessly clinging to Jesus. Does that sound like a better promise to you? <laughs> That's the best promise. He had the Elijah experience waiting for all of us. You have nothing now but me, and Jesus waits to see if that's enough for us. Is that enough for you? Amen. You have nothing but me, and you have all of me. So now, when I leave my position in the most holy place, you are able to stand in my life. Glorious, isn't it? Glorious, that's what Romans is predicting in that fifth chapter, how beautiful. And so, God had something better in mind for us so that they would not reach perfection, basically, until we also had. Hallelujah. Jesus is coming soon, you believe it? 